Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Life from the Inside Out with Chris. Before we begin with Chris's unparalleled metaphysical content, I know that many of you watching have felt a sense of being ungrounded, unhinged, or out of balance in these times. I know. I felt this way, too. Chris's teachings have similarities to popular ideas, such as the Law of Attraction and The Secret. The difference is that Chris's knowledge goes even deeper into reality creation and helps resolve many of the problems identified with the Law of Attraction. The information he shares helps restore grounding and that sense of balance that many of us have lost in these times. If you're ready for the Law of Attraction and Secret 2.0 and want to be a part of this fantastic community, then hit that like button, subscribe, drop a comment below, and press the bell icon so that you get notified when Chris releases cool new metaphysical content. Chris also offers life-changing online seminars, private sessions, and mentoring sessions, which are all linked in the description below. Glad you're here with us, and let's jump into it. And welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Life with the Inside, Life from the Inside Out, excuse me, with Chris. And yeah, last time we built on some of our discussions about with the imagination, but went a little bit uh, different way and started uh, talking about um, some of our ancestors and different ways in which humans and, and our species have been utilizing that imagination through throughout different uh, time periods or how it's really been with us um, always and uh, and yeah and and a little bit about uh, perhaps different spectrums of light and the senses and consciousness and how those are all interacting together and uh, I'd love to hear more about that Chris are you certain yes <laughs> indeed then or, or else we could just end the show there. <laughs> so you archaeologists, scientists, researchers, come to the conclusion that your ancestors followed a particular linear kind of development. Different humanoid prototypes, for lack of better words, that eventually culminated in the evolution of human beings as you have them now. And here and there, there were Neanderthals, there were this brand of humanoid, that brand of humanoid, and they're all trying to connect the family tree together as if the family tree would have had to come down from a one unique ancestor. But perhaps there might have been different waves of humanoid species that have come at different times and dispersed themselves through the planet or throughout the planet as best as they could at that time in different ways. Sometimes the motivation might have been disease or famine or drought or floods, natural cataclysms, even <clears throat> meteoric impacts that would have disrupted life in certain areas. The earth itself has undergone many different types of cycles, some with extreme catastrophic results, some with less and some with very minor changes as the physical environment sought to adapt itself to the needs of the incoming humanoid species. As these humanoid species also try to create the kind of body that was necessary to survive in the environment they were heading into. So there have been literally dozens of world-ending catastrophes, so to speak, of the Earth undergoing such radical 
transformations. <coughs> Some have been attributed to pole flipping catastrophes. Continents arising as the result of massive asteroids or comets hitting into the Earth. Volcanic eruptions and earthquakes that would have rendered large tracts of land useless, non-habitable for long, long periods of time. So human species or humanoid species would have had to leave perhaps coming back in certain ways thousands of years later to see how those environments had adapted and changed. Was it now suitable for human habitation? And they each considered themselves human in that respect. Neanderthals did not consider themselves Neanderthals. That is the name you have given them, as your modern species has given them. All in all, all of these great changes in one form or another were important to also test the adaptability of your ancestors and their capacity to withstand these different kinds of transformations to provide for themselves the adaptations necessary, whether it was genetic or otherwise, to carry into different experimentations. Now, it might also appear to your modern world that a particular branch of the ancient humanoids would have disappeared. Perhaps all died off, all killed off, all died from disaster or something or other. But taking into consideration the nature of alternate and probable worlds, some of those species simply went elsewhere, continued. There are realities where the Earth has had less and others where the Earth has had more catastrophes with greater changes and some of these other humanoid ancestors would have evolved in those other realities, as have many animals that have been extinct in your world for thousands, if not millions of years, or if not hundreds of years. They have not necessarily all completely vanished, but continued in other probable realities. And interestingly enough, certain kinds of animals that have been claimed extinct for even hundreds of years can sometimes suddenly be found again. Now it can be attributed to the fact that perhaps they were hiding or doing this and that, but when no animal has been spotted for hundreds of years and suddenly there are these animals one has to wonder exactly what is going on. We are not involving aliens in any of this. And it is not our forte, nor our preference. But we are saying that there are very interesting passageways, if you like, from one reality to the other. And of course, they do not involve specific portals or cosmic doors or anything like that, but they do involve letting go of a particular form. In this case, you call it death. Wherein the personality continues on a different path, a different journey. Now, we don't necessarily want to get overly involved in that process, but suffice it to say that previously we had suggested that the imagination, the feelings, and the emotions are not 
the result of your bodily form. In fact, your bodily form is the result of these particular processes. And in the same way, the imagination is also involved in procuring the means for that life to continue, but in a different environment, one that you can no longer see. So you would refer to these individuals as the dearly departed. They have departed. What would that mean, really? If I depart, where do I go? If you depart, where do you go? Where are you headed? What kind of journey are you going on? So those kinds of seemingly silly little questions actually have a point of validity because that very thing, the self, is an eternally valid self. It is not just the result of the body. Consciousness is not the result of the body. The self has its own eternal validity. So it will always continue, whatever its journey is. It simply needs to leave behind this particular environment, because that particular environment may no longer serve its specific needs. It may have a need to expand its understanding. That individual may and does have a need to expand its understanding of itself and of its very nature. And this particular world of yours may no longer be able to provide the kind of necessary hmm, excitement and discovery. So it needs new venues. It needs a new reality within which to make new discoveries about itself. And that also implies the use of feelings, emotions, and that lovely thing you call imagination. Because the imagination itself is multidimensional. And now why would someone do that? Why would a being take birth, whether it is in the form of your Neanderthal or Cro-Magnon ancestors, or even in the form of your own species, to continue, to leave it behind and continue, for a very, very simple, yet extremely profound reason. We spoke the other Monday at the group about the nature of love. We provided the example of a newborn, newborn baby being held for the first time by its mother. Its mother looking at that tiny, vulnerable, little life form. And the mother Sometimes the father or others would give their all to see the potential of that little being to fulfill itself. Our observation, as we provided to Joseph afterwards, is a very simple formula. What is love? Love is potential. So you come to this particular world, not because somehow or other you have been punished and you are sent here, not because somehow or other your soul got dirty and muddied and you must purify it. There is no such nonsense. But you are here because of love. Love is potential. So you see the potential of having your life lived in this environment at this particular crossroads of time and space. 
your spirit and flesh unite in this moment because of the potential, because of the love that is there. Your ancestors, as far back into the very history of the world as you can imagine it, have done the same thing. And you will continue to do so to the very ends of time as you can conceive it, and then more. You are here for the experience of the love, and that is the potential that you see in your life. You are here because of potential, of love. And that unites the feelings, emotions, and imagination in a laser-like focus that enables you to experience and express all of the elements of the life that you create. If you understand this little principle, your life may indeed be transformed because this is a game changer. Literally, all of time and space comes together in the moment where you have your presence. And you have your presence because you sense the love of the potential that is within you. And all forms of life, animate or not, function on that principle. You have experience for that very reason. So it behooves all manner of humans to consider what kind of thoughts, feelings, emotions, and imaginings that they entertain. Do you do so for your development or for your detriment? If you take just a moment to reflect on the following, perhaps you will understand. You do not cut your lawn, scrape your lawn, pick up all the leaves, all the garbage and the refuse you find all over your house and throw it into your house. Why? Because you live in that house, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. So it behooves all human beings to also consider what do they put in their minds. Because you live in your mind. You may think you live in your house, you live at home, you live here. These are just temporary habitats. Your true home is your mind. That is the seat of your being whilst you are in this vehicle that is the human body, the combination of spirit and flesh at that particular crossroads of time and space that you say is yourself, even though the body is not. But you are yourself and you live in your mind with your thoughts. So it is of great importance to be mindful of the kinds of thoughts and feelings you entertain. Are you prone to always blaming and projecting others? Or are you able to constructively and realistically look at the nature of your thoughts and realize that you have the ability to transform your lives now. So that is our challenge to the listeners, to the watchers, to all of you out there. What do you put in here? You know very well when you type code to 
allow your computer to perform certain tasks, whether it is in the form of the operating system, whether it is in the form of the server or applications. So if you want an application that allows you to do a very specific thing, do you just grab anything that comes your way and type it in there? No, you are careful about what you do because you want that application, that operating system, to work in a specific way. For the very same reason, you do not use Windows 11, but you put it in a system that operates on Windows 3.5. It is incompatible. Hmm? So it is about what you entertain here that involves the imagination more than you will ever understand. It is an extremely powerful tool. And from that, you have expectations. You formulate, you envision what you expect. Sometimes you have, we will just use the common term, unrealistic expectations about life. Some people may go through their whole lives expecting in life to be this way, to be that way, and it never works out. Other people have a different view, a different kind of expectation. And they flow through life so much more readily and easily, like a river flows along its bed. Does all of this make sense to you? Yeah, it does. I was just thinking a little bit, too, about our last conversation, um, particularly about worry and maybe even the maybe misuse of the imagination. I was thinking with the programming analogy, it'd be like wanting something and then writing the program of what you don't want. Um, and, and, and that would, be, would worry and you'd be like, why is it, why is it not showing up, you know? <laughs> Indeed, if you input code that tells your computer to crash and you expect your computer to perform flawlessly, you are going to have an incompatible situation. You might even be pulling your hair out. And then blame the computer. Indeed, as if computers can really manage their own things on their own. They cannot. Human input does that. So if you want to compare the mind to a computer, the very same principle applies. Be careful what kind of code you program in your computer. If you want nice outcomes, then stop catastrophizing. Stop worrying about when is the other shoe going to drop. And instead expect the best possible outcome. Every human being has been trained almost gleefully, as if it is a badge of honor to worry about the best, and we should say the best worst outcome, the most terrible things to come from anything that you do. You do not think for a moment that you might, just might, start thinking about an incredibly joyful, happy outcome. Consider it, to use your common vernacular, the happy ending of your imagination. It is possible, and you will see the results. No amount of catastrophizing or worrying excessively has ever produced any beneficial results. You do not have to take our word for that. Everyone listening and watching, test it out for yourself. Stop immediately contemplating the worst possible case scenario and start thinking about the best possible case scenario, even if you have to break a sweat. As they say, no pain, no gain. As Yoda says, no try, do. Yeah. And you will see what we are talking about. 
Well, I was thinking, Chris, that, you know, I was thinking of working towards a goal. And 90% of the time, I might be moving nicely towards that goal, and maybe 10% might be challenges or things that aren't going well. But if we only focus on the 10% challenges, we could totally miss that it's really working out and we're <coughs> moving towards that. You really can blow that up through the worry. Indeed. There are many occasions when someone will start to look for all the little things that have gone wrong in their lives. And all of a sudden, they are consumed with the idea that their entire lives have been one catastrophe after another, even if that is not the case. But they have worked themselves up to such a frenzy that they can no longer see the hundreds and hundreds of times when everything flowed nicely. And the more one concentrates on that, it literally becomes wearing a set of blinders. You cannot see anything but what you focus upon. It is a hypnotic state. It is drug-like, and you cannot see anything else. The only one who can get you out of that is yourself. By the realization that this truly does not work. So it is a good idea then to get off that track and to start considering the distinct possibility that not only a few, not only dozens, but hundreds and hundreds of things have gone very nicely for you over short and long periods of time. And the more you do that, the better you are. Hmm. Now, what do you call someone who constantly looks for any possible sign of illness in any form? A hypochondriac. So there are hypochondriacs, not just of bodily problems and illnesses, but hypochondriacs of events and circumstances and conditions. It is all they think about. And they become consumed and lose their zest for life. They are using their imagination and their creativity, definitely, but not necessarily to their advantage. They are utilizing it to their utmost disadvantage, burning their energy in a non-beneficial manner. It is still creative. It is still utilizing, getting what you concentrate upon. But it definitely does not benefit their lives. So just that small realization that you can definitely switch tracks and start looking for even small things that perhaps make you feel good or make you happy. Little things like looking at a child smile or a puppy, flowers, clouds, anything that uplifts the spirit and keep that going, in a short amount of time, you can actually see yourself being transformed. And looking at the nature of your own expectations is definitely going to help clean out the congestion, if you like, and very specifically, also begin to look for anything and everything that reflects your newfound energy, your newfound happiness, even in small amounts. And whenever you notice that your mind might want to go back to the old track, it might try to tell you, well, don't you miss all the worries and the suffering? You can just say, no. Imagine that saying no. And you can say it resoundly too. No, I am going in this direction and I have no interest 
no intention of visiting those old issues, those old worries and old problems. They are more or less dead to me. I have more interesting things and adventures in mind. Thank you very much, Mr. Worry. Bye-bye. I like that. It is an important consideration. So we urge everyone listening and watching to try this kind of experiment. It might just be the turning point that starts changing and transforming your life. But again, do not take our word for it. Test it out. And if you find it interesting enough, then ask yourself, would you go back to your old habits? Because all of these things are mental habits. They are mental addictions. Would you go back? to the darkness that you used to experience, or would you prefer to stay in the sunshine where you are now, basking in a much nicer experience? We cannot lead the horse to water. We can point in that direction. The water is down there. Have a look and satiate your thirst. Or in some modern vernacular, Denny's all-you-can-eat buffet is down that road. <laughs> well, yeah, if you don't lead somebody there, or don't lead the horse there, then they'll kind of learn to get their own water and, 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 and understand that. The, because you know the the interesting thing is then you would allow their own process too because everybody might go for that water a little different or in their own way indeed and going back to the example we provided about love being potential and the mother holding her newborn infant desiring to give her all because there is potential in that new life that is love. The same applies. You have to recognize the potential that exists in you to activate it. And that is also love. Does that make sense? Mm hmm Yep. Indeed. Now, it, perhaps it is a good time to end this segment. Yes, I believe it's time, and that was quite an episode. Thanks, Chris. Indeed. And keep in mind, love is potential. Allow this to literally seep very deep into your being and act on it. The mother cannot live the potential for the child. The child has to develop its own ability to crawl and then run towards its own potential. It has to live it itself. The mother cannot live it for that child. That is what it means to love, that you have potential and we see your potential in you, but you are the only one who can make it real, who can bring it alive. And with that, we thank you for your loving consideration and return, Joseph, to you. All right. Thanks, Chris. Mm -hmm. Thanks for watching. And if you would like to leave a question for Chris, drop it in the comments below. Myself, Serge, or someone from the Chris team will be checking and may use them to drive the discussion, put them in future episodes. So if you'd like to interact with the Chris community, feel free. Put your questions below. And we'd love to hear from you and see you again next time.